It is six o'clock and it is the first Thursday of the month. And that means it is time once again for the post prison education program radio show. And we are joined here live in the KODX studios this evening by Ari Cohn and Catherine Gusick and uh, both with the post prison education program. So uh, Ari, you want to take it away? Thanks, Mike. Um, hello. <laughs> so, uh, I started this program 15 years ago and and have shied away, I think out of cowardice, really, from talking about sex crimes and people who previously committed sex crimes because it is such an emotional topic uh, with everybody. Um, that I, I think it's uh, it's impossible or very seldom that you can have a, a conversation about that subject. But um, a guy walked in our office the other day, maybe last Saturday, I forget, but within the last week, and he did 11 years in prison and he's been out for 10 years since then, and he's a very successful iron worker, and he's a super hardworking guy, and he's living a really miserable life for something that happened more than 20 years ago. And it just got me uh, thinking that, that we should address this. So tonight what I wanna do is spend about 20 minutes um, talking about sex crimes and people with a history of, of having committed sex crimes and then 20 minutes talking about one Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, anecdote and then the final 20 minutes talking about uh, another Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation anecdote. Um, I I, you know, um, I want to... I think I should talk about um, the mis again the misconception that people have about who prisoners are and and um, we I it was interesting we in the last ten days we've gotten seventy eight thousand seventy five dollars have come into the program and uh, and I made a list of those of those donations one at a time so there's 50,000 from a googler 10,000 from a googler 5,000 from a relative of a former student of ours um, and then 75 from somebody at Microsoft and 250 for, for somebody who works at the Federal Defender's Office and uh, 10,000 from another Googler who used to give stock and this time gave cash, which was wonderful. A um, 1,000 from a, a guy that uh, has been to prison with us many times, um, 250 from somebody I don't know. Uh, a thousand from a PhD microeconomist at, at uh, Amazon who, and 500 from another Googler and then 250 from a guy who's been with the Department of Corrections for 30 plus years in a high management position. And the common thread amongst these people that donate so much money uh, um, is that, that of the $78,075, $77,000 is from people who've been to prison and taken the time to meet prisoners. And Mike and Catherine both know this because they're both in the office a lot. They've both been to prison with us. Um, I don't have, Mike, how many times have you been to prison? You just keep recidivating. You keep going back and you go back and you go back. <laughs> Your program is not helping me. I've been to prison three yeah, times now we, because of we, you. We, we haven't taught you right. It's like, it's like we took Catherine, was it? She never went back. <laughs> but you keep going back. Yeah. So, But the common thread is, is, I don't know what the percentage is, but the common thread is 77000 bucks, and out of the 78000 
$75 in the last 10 days has been people who've gotten up close and personal and, and, and met prisoners and former prisoners and, and discovered their humanity and discovered that the Seattle Times and all this mainstream media and Bleth and Bleth and Bleth and Incorporated, as I call them, is it's like half truths and, and lies and false reporting. And I, I found an email that I want to read, and then we'll start talking um, more specifics. But years ago, we had on our board of directors a woman named Lori Gilfoyle, and she used to work for United Way. And I kept, she was a community impact manager with United Way, and I kept bugging her to go to prison with us. And I used to, her, her office was right across the street. United Way is right across the street from where we were for 14 years in the central building. And so she would be in our office like multiple times a week, five o'clock quitting time. She'd pop in, she'd talk to students and applicants and staff, and uh, she helped read applications. And um, so we saw a lot of her, but we took her out to Aberdeen, to the, to the men's prison at Aberdeen. And we had that day, we had about, I think it was 274 guys in the visit room with us for three hours. And, you know, it, you both know when, when we're, we're in the prison, we're, we're right there in, in the midst. It, it, uh, and, and we're surrounded by prisoners and, um, and we're... It feels like a different world. Just, yeah, that's what you're focused on. You're not out, you know, out in the real, in the real world. Yeah, and you're just, in, but you're you're like up close and personal, and there's uh, there's there's never any fear that you you realize you're talking to human beings. But the weird thing that happened with Lori was after that trip, she just disappeared, and and it, and it started freaking me out, and 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 because for about a week. We didn't hear from her. She didn't pop in the office. And I'm thinking, like, you know, something went wrong, which we've never had anything go wrong. But I'm thinking something went wrong, you know, what's going on. And then all of a sudden, we got this email, which I'm going to read. Uh, really hard to read. So she said, I have been pretty quiet since our visit last week. I have a group of really good friends that I go out for drinks with every Friday after work. Last week, I couldn't go, just didn't feel right. I talked to my mom a couple times a week. She lives in Oklahoma. I haven't called her. Saturday, I just got in the car and went for a drive out to Mount Rainier. Every time I talk about it, I cry. Every time I think about the men I met, I cry. Every time I think about Becky, Vance, Dolphy, or Pollard, I cry. I cry in my car, at my desk, as I'm working out in the garden. I thought I was okay about people honoring and respecting all people for who they are. But until last week, I don't think I really understood <clears throat> what it means to honor and respect all people for who they are. I have so much to learn, and I thank you. Deeply thank you for giving me the opportunities you have given me. So the, that's, you know, I just want, uh, I'm just, I read that because I want you to know that the people we've got locked up, regardless of their crime, if they committed a murder, 25 years ago, if they broke in your house because they're addicted or mentally ill or both and stole your electronics so they could pawn them, if it, whatever, if they committed a sex crime, um, there's a story behind that and they're human beings. Um, to get to the topic of sex crimes, um, what, what, I came up as a conservative, I came up in a very conservative family in Central Florida, redneck, Republican, Central Florida, citrus and cattle country. And um, 
And I sort of had those values when I started this program in 2005. So, uh, and I thought at the time, I didn't even think about it. Uh, we had been helping people with sex crimes before I realized we were, because we don't focus at all on what's what somebody we're, we're looking at the future we're future envisioning we're not looking at the past um and and so we don't focus on what the what the crime is that caused people to go to prison uh and we don't even ask it on the application but, but at some point i had it in my head that maybe two or three percent of washington's prisoners are people who previously committed a sex crime and then Quite some years ago, uh, I saw on a Department of Corrections fact card uh, that it was close to 20%. And I was going to say in today's radio show that it was 19% because the last time I looked at the Department of Corrections data section on their website, which actually is pretty comprehensive, by the way, uh, it was 19%. But I looked this afternoon, it's 21%. So th this is, is, is a steadily growing group of people and, and that's now passed more than one in five. And we better pay attention to what's going on uh, because it's, it's a reality. To, and so um, when it got real for us um, was in 2007, we were two years old, and... Um, a woman named Margaret Peggy Kello, K-E-L-L-O-W, who was employed at the time by the, in, by the district court, the federal court, Western District of Washington. Uh, and she was the person who um, supervised the, the, the sex offender unit at, for the federal court. And she... And I don't even know how she got my name. We didn't even know we existed in 2007. But, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like when Google found us in 2009. We are like, we didn't even know we existed. And, but somehow people were starting to know. And, and, but she wanted to know, and she was pretty pushy about it. She wanted to know if we had a policy about people, that, that, uh, about people people who committed sex crimes applying to our program. You know, did we penalize them because of the crime or not? And it was really clear that this woman wanted us to not be handling those applications any different than we would anybody else. And so at the time, uh, Sonal Abraham, who's a lawyer with the feds now, uh, was on our board and his wife, Brenda, worked in the unit at the Defender Association that full-time defended people with sex crimes. And out of ignorance, we just turned the board of directors over to Sunnel and, and asked him to educate us and help us develop the policy that the feds, the federal court, was demanding that we have. And, uh, and so we went through quite a few meetings and, and, uh, and then we came up with a policy and I'm going to just read it to you. Uh, uh, this was the motion to our board. It was, uh, moved the post prison education program will not disqualify any individual based on their status as a registered sex offender, uh, for participation in the post prison education program. The motion was seconded and passed unanimously. Um, we adhered to that uh, all these years. So I kind of want to talk about, you know, there's all these, um, there's all these uh, misconceptions that the public has uh, about what sex crimes are committed, who commits them, what happens, how it happens. And I want to really quickly, and it's going to take me, we're going to go past our 20 minutes for this segment. Oh, because that's fine. Because we're at 6.15 <laughs> already. But I, I want to um, tell you uh, about 
my learning experience. So it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a Barry Goldwater. I, not now. I'm My politics are, I always say, to the left of Che Guevara. But, uh, but, but when I started this program on this subject, people who committed sex crimes, my, uh, I was pretty Republican. You know, conservative, Central Florida, cattle country, citrus, redneck, hater, closed-minded Republican. And wasn't sympathetic at all or open-minded at all. And then this is what happened um, that really kicked off my learning experience and, and changed my belief system dramatically. So I used to live in Wedgwood, and I had a, one of the bedrooms was an, was an office, so if, and, and I had a fax machine there. And one day I was working from home instead of the office, and the fax machine started going. And I still have this fax. If anybody wants to come by, they can read it. And it just started out to be the longest fax in the history of the world. It just kept going and going and going. And I'm like, what in the heck is going on? And, and, and finally, it was a 23-page fax, and it was from a graduate of our program. And the short version was, was her older, which she went to prison for a meth case. And when she went to prison, her husband and their kids were, were free on the streets, right? And the husband uh, got a girlfriend, and so she had her children, and her, her kids were with her husband as she's in prison. And her oldest son forced anal intercourse on the girlfriend's youngest daughter, twice. And what the facts was about, and I should just tell you, you can't talk about a lot of things without being specific, and I'm not, as you just saw or heard, I'm not going to um, use euphemisms or whatever. We'll just, we'll just call it what it is. So... Um, the, uh, the facts was it took DSHS, DSH CPS, Child Protective Service, four years to investigate, uh, what, what had happened and come to a, a, a determination. And so what this 23 page facts was, was, uh, was the CPS report. And it was it was being turned over to a police department in in, in Washington State, which would then make an evi- determination whether this kid, who at that point was 14, but he had been much younger when what happened happened, um, would he, whether he would be prosecuted or not. And my my concern, frankly, wasn't so much for the son, but it was for our student because I knew if she, I knew if if her son was uh, prosecuted, then she might relapse. And then the whole family, which had just gotten put together again and reunited and uh, would, would fall apart. And, 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 and I didn't want that to happen. So at that time, there were three women in my life that that I immediately thought of. Um, one was an employee of the Department of Corrections who I knew had been raped when she was 12 years old uh, repeatedly by a family member. And so uh, I, I called her and, uh, and I'm expecting, she wasn't particularly militant feminist and 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 uh like the other two women that i'll tell you about were but she's certainly pro women and i was expecting vitriol and anger like this kid did what you know and 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 what i got was the exact opposite so she she, she's the first thing out of her mouth i was i'll never forget i was on the way to olympia to testify at some hearing and she said, Ari, for him to have known to, to do that, it had to have happened to him. That was the, that I, 
totally didn't expect that reaction. I was really expecting vitriol and anger and, and, and sort of females circling the wagon, protecting, protective of females and anti-male, and that was a horrible thing, and shoot him at dawn kind of an attitude. And I got the exact opposite from a, an educated person who, by the way, came from the Catholic diocese and, 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 and to the Department of Corrections. And so the, then my next call was, an, uh, was to a woman who's a public defender now in Snohomish County. And she had been on our original board of directors and, and, and Kelly is militant. I always tease people like she's probably got two Uzi machine guns in her purse and she's just, she's just a firebrand and a fighter for social justice. And I really expected vitriol and anger from her. And this, she said to me the exact same thing that, 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 the first person, woman I had called. It was like, for exactly, the, the, for that to happen to him, for him to know to do that, it had to have happened to him. And trying to shorten this, the third call was to a woman who also was on our board of directors, was a federal, I mean, was a public defender. She's now in Atlanta. Um, and and, and I, again, I was, ex and, and she has children. And so I'm expecting the same thing, and I got from her what I got from from Kelly and Joan, which was like, it, 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 you know, that for him to, for that to have happened, it had, it had to have happened to him. And, and so that like that one hour drive to Olympia, I learned more than I've learned in, in many, many years of, about a lot of things. And so that's when I started thinking about learned behavior. And, and, you know, we went from there to, um, being asked, to take over a transition house, Interaction Transition got into huge financial trouble with Home Street Bank and a, and a transition house that housed 28 men and women, all of whom were on probation for sex crimes, uh, was going to be foreclosed and those people were going to be on the streets. And we took that over and, uh, and so then we were deeply involved on a day in and day out basis with 28 men and women who committed sex crimes. And so, so we, it, it, the, the long and the short of it is in, um, in all of the years of the post-prison education program, almost 15 years, I've met one person uh, who claimed that uh, learned behavior wasn't uh, uh, part of what she did. So there's a, a mom who lived in that transition house had raped her nine-year-old son. And we met her when she was on probation with the Department of Corrections. And, uh, and, she, and she told me that she went to her son and, 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 and recalled verbally that when she had raped him and asked her son, do you remember this? And the and the and she told me that her son told her yes, and it was like the scariest, worst moment of his life, and that he would never forget it. And she got up and took herself to the police department, turned herself in. Uh, but she was she insisted that nothing had ever happened to her earlier in life. So, and I don't know if it wasn't psychological denial, and I tend to think it was, <laughs> but but. All the other histories we know, and and um, and, and and it's it's pretty much like we have a student um, who um, was running and gunning. I guess you could say twenty four, twenty five years ago, and and the state took her son away, and he went into foster care, and. What seems to me to happen in foster care is you get raped and, and sexually assaulted and abused. And, and that happened to the student's son, and then he grew up repeatedly. And then he grew up and did to somebody what had been done to him. So I, I fervently pretty much believe that sex crimes come out of learned behavior and, and that uh, you just 
going through the process of young life, you, when that happens, you come to believe that that's what people who love and trust each other do to each other because that's what you all you've known in your life, and then you grow up and you do it to somebody, and then you end up in jail and prison. So take that for whatever it's worth, uh, but uh, we've got a lot of experience and a lot of history, and our population pretty much matches the Department of Corrections. Uh, we've never violated the... Uh, uh, policy that the feds asked us to, to develop. Uh, we, we don't look and say, okay, this person committed murder, we'll, we'll work with him or her. This person has a sex crime, we won't work with them. This person has a property crime. You know, we don't, we don't do that. Uh, and so I, I want to switch over and tell you about the first case where we were heavily involved uh, with court. Uh, I have um, a close friend and a neighbor, uh, and we're currently involved in a case with her right now. And um, several years ago, she wrote to me an email, and and there was a young kid out. Uh, for those who don't know, McNeil Island has a prison on it. Um, and it's under DSHS, and it's called the Special Commitment Center. And so people with sex crimes can be put out on this island for life. And this uh, young guy uh, was out on McNeil, and this defense attorney that reached out to me um, wanted us to get involved. And, uh, and would we support him if she could get him released from McNeil? And I just, just to show you, the whole show's going to end up being about this, and I'm not even going to get to talk about, <laughs> about the Gates Foundation, which really, can I say pissed off? Good, that pisses me off. So, uh, um, but uh, this is what transpired. So, um, this was a young, uh, I don't think race has anything to do with it, but a, a, a young man, uh, and his experience with sex crimes, I'm going to tell you. Just to show you how ridiculous Bob Ferguson's attorney general's office is and how wrongheaded his assistant attorney generals are and how egregiously horrible things can play out, I'm going to tell you this kid's story. And, and, and um, so at age 12, um, this, this young man's mom is, has drug and alcohol and addiction and mental health issues. So she's about as stable. Uh, my my second ex-wife's dad used to say my second ex-wife was about as stable as a fart in a windstorm. Can I say that, Mike? <laughs> Good. <laughs> and that's about how stable this kid's mom was. So um, um, at 12 years old, I mean, Catherine and I were talking about this the other day, and um, and I asked her if she – I think everybody goes through – your young kids and little boys are curious about girls and girls are curious about boys. And as you get into this, you show me yours, I'll show you mine kind of a thing. And, and, um, and in that kind of a scenario, uh, this young man ended up with a group of young kids and, and out, out of that, and he was 12 years old and out of that, uh, there was a dare that he won so he could claim the dare or whatever. And he, 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 he dared this little girl who was part of that, this group of children uh, to put his penis in her mouth, right? 12-year-old kids, these are just kids. In my mind, it's just like I remember Illyria, Ohio, next to my cousin's house in the basement, uh, you know, next door. It's just Kids' curiosity, 12-year-old kid, everything's consensual, nothing's forced, 
and and he wins this dare and that was the dare you know that she this little girl put his penis in her mouth and she did the mom the unstable mom finds out about it and goes berserk and she reports her son to cps and he ended up locked up for four years from 12 to 16. and then he's free for a couple years and uh at about 18 um he goes basically next door and he steals a woman's panties. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, and he takes the panties home and he uses them for a masturbation fantasy or whatever. No contact with anybody. And it, and it reminded me when I was at the University of Florida back in the 1700s, we used to have panty raids. And guy, really, we did. It, guys would break into the girls' dorms. It was, it was the first couple of years where there were co-ed dorms, and guys would break into the girls' dorms, and maybe the guys were on the sixth floor and the gals were on the seventh floor. You'd go up to their floor and you'd steal their panties, and then that, and then you'd hang them all over campus. And then that night, everybody get together and have keg parties and get drunk and laugh. And it was nobody gave a damn, right? And and it was just, but this kid stole this woman's panties and used them as a masturbation fantasy. And, um, and again, the mom found out about it and went wild. And this time he's an adult, he's 18 and charges are brought and he ends up with my lawyer friend calls the worst public defender in the history of the world. And this guy talks this young kid into pleading is a sexually violent predator, right? He stole a woman's panties, no human contact, and he's a sexually violent predator. And, and he ended up on McNeil Island in the Special Commitment Center. Four years later, um, my attorney friend, um, I invited her to be on the show tonight, but she was in a, a deposition for a retrial that starts Monday. Um, and, 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 and we may have a repeat of this next show with, with her, with Sonia on. And, um, but Sonia became aware of what had happened and she's not standing for that kind of thing. Um, and so we got involved. We, we interviewed him out at the special commitment center. Um, and we wrote a letter to the attorney general's office that if he was released, we would support him with housing and education and everything at our, that we could possibly do, we would, we would do. Um, and that letter went, it didn't work. It did, it went nowhere. So, uh, it, they set a trial in Bellingham and the attorney thought it was going to be a, three-week trial she's got kids and she lives close to me at Green Lake and uh, and and so she's up there in a hotel the trial went five weeks four or five weeks and uh, at the, it, it, during the trial uh, this the young man who became a student of ours was asked what he missed most while he locked was locked up and he and he told the court and the jurors pizza and bubble gum. And so when the trial was over, the attorney general's office was reprimanded and this young man was freed immediately. And the jurors took up, they, they felt that what had happened to him was so wrong. They took up a collection. The jurors took up a collection so that the attorney and their social worker could go out and buy this young man pizza and bubble gum. Right. So that's, that's, that's how ridiculous the state of Washington can be. And I, I was talking to this attorney, um, the other day and, um, I'm not putting her name on the air because I don't want it to trace back to the student. Um, but, uh, um, just the other day, and I and I, I was like, 
we were talking about other couple of cases we've been involved in, and I'm like, why doesn't somebody take this to Bob Ferguson? So I like Bob Ferguson's on my Facebook page when he was a member of local government. I thought he was a pretty cool guy. I wish I was hoping he would run for governor and Inslee would get humiliated and disappear forevermore and 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 just vaporize, va- evaporate, be gone. And, uh, and 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 this lawyer was like, he's the problem. Bob Ferguson is the problem. So. He, it's like legislative cowardice. He doesn't want to be sick because he wants to run for governor after Inslee's finished his 67th term in the year 3022. Ferguson wants to be governor, right? Uh, and so he's not going to get into the press for doing anything reasonable or logical or moral or just on these sex crime cases. And so he's being a total unmitigated I think you told me, I'm not sure if you told me I could say this word, a-hole. I think I can't say that word. So, uh, okay, so, all right. Gosh, I, the SEC needs to go jump on. Anyway, <laughs> so it, it's just like, just if, if, if we come away from this show with um, everybody agreeing to just be a, a little more open-minded on this topic and, 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 ask questions and learn um, it, 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 uh, then the, then I'll, I'll be glad we we had this conversation so um, I uh, um, I want I want to talk about Gates Foundation for a minute. Um, and, and by the way, anybody who if you know we're our offices in Soto, we're one block east of the um, Link Light Rail station. It's easy to get there. There's ample parking in uh, and public transportation is super. And I'm like super wide open to having you come visit the office and discuss this in greater detail. You can email questions to questions at postprisonedu.org. But it's about time, uh, and I think we're 15 years too late doing this, that we have have a conversation about people with sex crimes. But switching over to the Gates Foundation, um, I will, I'll tell you, uh, not many people have my cell phone number, and I'm pretty protective of it. And when it got out of hand a couple of years ago, to the point that that it was ridiculous, I, I I made my cell phone number be the emergency number for the program, and I got a new number. Which I so so for when I get a call on my cell phone and it shows the caller, it doesn't show the name of the caller. They're not in my they're not in my Outlook contact. That's really weird. So. Some years ago, I'm walking across our old office at the Central Building, and my cell phone's in my hand like everybody. It's like super glued there. I sleep with it. I go to the shower with it. I can't eat dinner with silverware because the phone's glued to my hand. And, and, and my phone goes off, and it doesn't show somebody's name. And I almost didn't answer it. And, and I did answer it, and it was Alan Golston, who at the time, and he may still be as president of Gates Foundation U.S. programs. And how he got my number, I don't know, but he got it. And it was a two-hour conversation. Alan is a black guy and, again, president of U.S. programs for Gates, so he's fairly high up in their hierarchy. He can't tell Bill and Melinda what to do, but he's, he's up there in the stratosphere and he was calling me uh, because his brother had a felony conviction and had not been able to get a job with um, I think Comcast or FedEx right but and, and he and Alan had tried to get his employer the Gates Foundation to work with him in U.S. programs to develop algorithms 
that would basically prove to society and large employers like Comcast, FedEx, the high value of prisoners and former prisoners. And his request to, to, to Gates Foundation, to say it nicely, fell on deaf ears. Like his employer was having nothing to do with it. And I'm assuming at his level, you're talking about Bill and Bill the kid and Melinda uh, and not Bill the old man. And, uh, and, uh, but at whatever level he went to, he wasn't being allowed. And what he wanted me to do was to introduce him to Google. So he knew when he called me that I had, and by the way, a Googler gave me this, this hoodie that I'm wearing, and on the back it says Google Cloud. And you'll never catch me wearing one that says Microsoft anything. Never, won't happen. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I introduced Alan to the guy that was our main contact at, at uh, Google at the time in terms of our funding. And, um, and they had a discussion about Google helping Gates Foundation's U.S. programs develop algorithms that the Gates Foundation wasn't willing to help the Gates Foundation develop, which I thought was the height of insanity, right? But it shows you where the Gates Foundation thinking is. You know, so um, I've, I've stayed in touch with him off and on, maybe once, not even once a year, or something will pop up. Doris Buffett, before she devolved into uh, being cognitively impaired, uh, wanted uh was flying in here for a graduation in 2015 uh, she went into washington state penitentiary and coyote ridge corrections center for graduations in june of 2015 and she was willing she wanted to stop at the gates foundation and have a conversation with gates with the foundation about the importance of post-secondary education for prisoners but her, 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 her strict, Doris is like a no nonsense, don't miss words, super lady. Um, and she was like, don't waste my time. Don't get me an appointment with some clown who can't make a decision. So I called Alan and, uh, and then put him and Doris in, together in a conversation along with Mitty Beal, Doris's director at the time. And, and I think Alan knew at that point that regardless of his position as president, right, um, that he couldn't ever move the Gates Foundation to supporting post-secondary education for adult prisoners. Uh, and so the meeting between Doris and, and Alan or anybody else didn't happen. She flew in from Fredericksburg, Virginia, changed planes at SeaTac, and went on down to Walla Walla and didn't spend a minute at the Gates Foundation. Um, and that's presumably because it would have been a wasted minute. And, and Alan um, knew it, and, and she wasn't going to be talking to wasting time. So um, so that's, that's uh, I think, very, very telling. You know, we, we and it kind of, I mean, I think, I've got, um, I'm looking at the clock. I, it's like, um, we've got 16 minutes, right? Can you talk about everything? No, I'm, I almost <laughs> can, and, and, and uh, I'm going to try. So um, there, it, it's close to Gates Foundation got to post-secondary education for adult former prisoners was uh, there were meetings going on at Ford Foundation in New York and um, Doris Buffett personally and, and Doris I mean the Sunshine Lady Foundation was in Philadelphia 
but Doris lived in Fredericksburg. That's where she and Warren family home was. And so she didn't just like pop up from Philadelphia to New York, the Ford Foundation, she was popping up from Fredericksburg, but she and, and Mitty Beal, who was her director at the time, were meeting with people like uh, Doug uh, Wood at, at, from Ford Foundation and people from Soros and Kellogg Foundation and um, there was a fifth foundation in in New York at Ford Foundation. And um, Doris recommended to Doug Wood at Ford Foundation, and Steve Patrick from Gates Foundation was involved. That's that was the deal. And and he Steve is with Aspen now, but at the time he was with with. Uh, Gates is a senior program manager, and we got four. Are you? Are we okay? We got 14 minutes. You're grinning. You're like, all right. All right so, <laughs> anyway, so so uh, so anyway, it, uh, I, Doris recommended to Steve, who was putting together this PowerPoint that I'll try to hold up for the camera. Um, which was Prison to Post-Secondary Education Initiative. That's how Steve Patrick originally built it. And it was, at the time, it was Open Society Foundations, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Barry Institute of Justice. And later, Kellogg and Ford uh, were heavily involved, the Sunshine Lady Foundation. But, but Doris recommended to Steve Patrick that he get in touch with me, and he did. And so it was my first venture over to the Versailles Palace, which some people call the Gates Foundation, and and I actually had to put a suit on, and I had to put on Johnston and Murphy dress shoes and socks even, and uh, and go over to the to the second largest conference room I've ever been in my life, and uh, met with Steve multiple times, um, t giving them our two cents worth on on. Um, what this prison to post-secondary education initiative should consider, right? And um, it, fi it finally got around to, we're going to be able to do this. It, 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 it finally got around to um, four foundations, Ford, Soros, Gates, and uh, Kellogg were going to put up advocacy money so like for research Doris Buffett had a policy that it was direct service you know you were going to be buying groceries with her money and paying rent you weren't going to be part of this yak 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 talk 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 enclave and 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 uh, so the the direct service money for the groceries and the rent and and so on that was going to come from sunshine lady and then it got down to who, who's putting up how much and, and what I was told, and I don't know if it's true or not, is, is uh, a, a, a woman who's sort of, she's one of the top 20 rated philanthropists on earth. She's, I've never met her, but she's incredibly smart. Steve Patrick knows her very well. Her name's Hillary Pennington. Um, she was at Gates Foundation at the time, and she was, she, I'm told, got Alan Goldston to agree to the almost one million that Gates Foundation put into this prison post-secondary education initiative. And, and what I was told by internal Gates people was that, that that Hillary or Allen, it, that it was clear that if there had been one more dollar asked for than the million or the 999,000 that they got, it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have cleared Bill and Melinda or Bill, Bill and Melinda or whoever the people are between Allen Goldston and the trustees. It wouldn't have cleared them. And so, um, so at this stage, Hillary Pennington's working with Steve Patrick sort of made this happen. And it ended up being something managed by Vera Institute that states were able to bid on. And uh, it was originally going to be two states. Bernie Warner at the, 
who was head of DOC in Washington, botched, badly botched the Washington State bid. Uh, and so two other states got it, and finally a third state was added. Um, and, and Washington had that to, to, they had that to lose, and Bernie Warner lost it, uh, which is another show, but he, he's an idiot. Thank God he's not in Washington anymore. So um, he's an a-hole, not an idiot. And so, uh, but anyhow, so Hillary sort of working with Steve Patrick made this happen. But then she went, to, um, now we're in trouble, we've got 10 minutes. She went to Ford Foundation. And so at, at Ford Foundation, the, the, the post-prison education program's future or hopes for a financially solid future were to do research, because we can get funding for research, right? Um, and then pass that money through to the post-prison education program so it can do what it does and be studied. And then the results be reported to funders and government and have that lead to systemic change that's positive. And so at the time that Hillary went to Ford Foundation from Gates, Doug Woods division at Ford Foundation, and you're talking the second largest foundation on earth, um, had, had, had a, uh, a mission statement, which we stole or plagiarized or whatever. And so our version of it uh, is right off of what used to be Doug's website within the Ford Foundation. So the, we created, Doris Buffett kicked in 35000 and we created the Alliance for Fiscal Responsibility, Fairness, and Social Justice or something like that and I just call it for short, Alliance for Fiscal Responsibility, right? And, and, we, and, and we adopted Ford Foundation's uh, mission. And, and so the mission we came up with, the mission of the Alliance for Fiscal Responsibility is to force positive systemic policy changes and institutional reforms in order to deliver disadvantaged people's access to and success in high quality higher education. So they had this division at Ford under a guy named Doug Wood, who's incredibly smart, super smart guy, uh, social justice oriented. And, and, and that mission that I just read to you was Doug's group's mission, right? Hillary goes from Gates to Ford and becomes Doug's boss, right? And immediately changed the mission of of, of Doug's group of Ford Foundation. So it was so, it, it, it killed the mission and made his group be all about kids. And so, so it, which was just like, I mean, just, just destroyed it. And you know what's so funny is, it's not funny. Hillary Pennington has a blog. And she, a couple of years ago, she, in her blog, she slammed Stanford for doing massive scholarships for privileged kids. From privileged families and she and she wrote like if I was to write I mean she wrote what I would have her write right which is like have scholarships go to disadvantaged people who you know don't come from privileged families it was like the blog post of the century as far as I was concerned but it, it was all a, like a ruse or a lie because she she killed all of Doug War Woods work that was promulgating and advancing what, what, what she was blogging needed to happen and criticizing Stanford for not doing. So with what she did, so she got to Ford and she destroyed, she literally destroyed Ford Foundation doing, moving post-secondary education forward for adult former prisoners. And, and literally, I mean, the, I've got an email in my inbox. It's our I archive email, which I'm famous for. And, and um, almost, I just don't delete email if it's got any chance of being important. And I've got an email from Steve Patrick that just talks about Doug's not, uh, wasn't allowed by Hillary to do what he used to do. It was, so she, she went from Gates Foundation where she sort of made this prison to post-secondary education initiative happen, K 
came up with the first million bucks or a consequential amount of the initial money. And then she goes to Ford Foundation and she just absolutely obliterates it. So um, the, uh, that's my Hillary Pennington, Rant. you know, <laughs> Gates Foundation, you know, rant. And, you know, you two for the next, I, this is the most I've ever talked unendingly and without you saying right. a word, Catherine, ever, not a word, not a peep. So like, but I like hearing from you. You have a lot of interesting stories that I clearly can't say. Well, talk about any of this. You know, do you want to go back and talk about people with history of sex? I mean, one thing that I remember that? Ari mentioning that was really interesting was the fact that most people that are in prison for sex crimes are youth. <laughs> like you mentioned, right? Is that correct? They're youth. That's well, what I, I mean, read. A lot of, I, mean, I think that was even on the DOC's website. Well, I mean, th there's no, I didn't say that. Uh, and there's a lot Maybe of, not youth, but young adults. Well, the crime, the... Or, no, the, it was youth, yeah. A lot of the people, where that comes out is people aging out of foster care. All right. Uh, and land in prison. Like I was in the Washington State reformatory at Monroe in the chapel quite a few years ago and the Black Prisoners Caucus brought, had worked with the Department of Corrections to bring over into the chapel and to this BPC event all the young men that that were that were locked up there doing life and there was like 25 or 30 guys that were young doing life in that one prison, uh, but that was a different um, that was a different subject. But it's just I think the Mike just signaled we're down to three minutes, which now we're down to right. two probably. So we're like I just I just think that we what is happening with people with sex crimes is wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, and I think a good way to wrap this up is winter quarter two thousand twelve. We had a student kicked out of the University of Washington classes. Um, we hired lawyers, and three days later, he was back in. And today, he has a master's degree in applied math, but but um, from the University of Washington. Uh, but the the uh, on the way to a meeting. I got on the 44 one morning in Wallingford, and Dolphy Jordan was on there, and, and 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 this was all in the news. I mean, I had media calling me all night long. Catherine Long from the Seattle Times, 12:30 in the middle of the night, trying to hook up with me to, for an interview, and and the deal was like Dolphy was like, I don't get it. Somebody can commit murder, a violent first degree murder, premeditated go do their time in prison, come out and be welcome everywhere. They're not pariah for the rest of their life. But you commit a sex crime and nobody dies. And I'm not belittling sex crimes or murder or selling drugs to kids, any of it. Uh, and you're pariah till, till forever. Just so like the guy that was in our office the other day, you know, for a, a crime for 25 years ago, he does 11 years, he's been out for 10 years, he's an iron worker, he's a valued member of the community, he's law-abiding, tax-paying, hard-working good dude, and his life is miserable because he still has to register as level three. So I just, it's a conversation we should have, and I, and I hope people will be open-minded about it. And I'll probably wish that we never did this and that, and that I was right the first 15 years of the program to not have this conversation but once again I'm proving I'm an idiot <laughs> or whatever all right so it sounds like a conversation that uh, will be picked up on one of the uh, future shows on the first Thursday of the month maybe next the next one if right. she's not a trial okay yeah there's a lot to still cover definitely All right, and again, the contact information for Post Prison Education Program is postprisonedu.org. That's yep. the website? Yep. Or yeah. just contact Ari Khan, right? Yeah, you can 
you know, my email is ra.cone at postprisonedu.org or qu questions at postprisonedu.org uh, or come visit the office. Um, and, and, but just if, if you come around me on this topic or any topic, be open-minded or you won't be there long. <laughs>